One, the new science made absolutely prodigious use of mathematics, and from Galileo to Newton, and mm. above all with Newton, men began to understand that throughout the universe there are, so to speak, e equations buried in reality. Yeah. Uh, how did Locke uh, see this? I mean, how did he view the nature of mathematics and, through science, its application to reality? Well, his explanation of the possibility of mathematical science and geometry say, in particular, mm. Mm. is quite uh, really rather different from Descartes. I mean, Descartes, for, ge for Descartes, geometry is a part of the science of space. I mean, it's, it's a part of the science of reality. But for Locke, it's uh, a science, an abstract science, which is created by us. We, so to speak, pick off um, geometrical, geometrical properties of things, and uh, we can construct them ad lib and uh, we can create a sort of science for that reason, precisely because it's not really concerned with the nature of things at all, which is unknown. It's simply concerned, as he puts it, with our own ideas. Yes. When we observe things, um, they affect us uh, in ways which cause us to observe, as we think, properties in the things. Mm. Now, Locke thought that these properties were all of two basic kinds, didn't he? That there were some properties in things which they possessed, whether anyone was observing them or not. Um, uh, he called those primary qualities, yes. didn't he? And that would include, I suppose, all the mathematical ones, the measurable ones. The mechanical ones. The mechanical yes. ones, yes. Uh, like the dimensions and the weight and so on. Yes. And there were other qualitative uh, properties, like sounds and smells and tastes and colors, yes. that he thought depended on an observer. We're beginning to gather the materials together for a sort of outline sketch of a whole picture of the world, and I'd like to draw the threads together before we take any more forward steps. It's really going back to the beginning of our discussion and, and taking it up to this point, that Locke thought that the world, as we experience it, consists of two fundamentally different sorts of entities, minds and material objects that we can't know what these are in their inner nature, and in their inner nature these remain permanently mysterious to us, but we do have direct experience of, of what they do, of how they behave. One of the things that material objects do is affect us. They affect us through our senses in various ways which give us experiences or representations or images of their properties and that we perceive their properties of being, again, of two fundamental kinds. There are the, the primary qualities, which are the mathematical properties, and the secondary qualities, which are mind-dependent mm. and, and, and of a sensory or qualitative nature. Now, this sort of view of the world is, is extraordinarily close, it seems to me, to one which is still very widely held yes. and widely regarded as a sort of common-sense view. Up to this point in the discussion, though, we haven't said anything at all about one thing which is of enormous importance to 20th century philosophers and was of enormous importance to Locke, though we haven't mentioned it yet, and that's language. Um, Locke, the, the, the essay concerning human understanding is written in four books, and one whole book is devoted to the use of words. How did Locke see language as coming into or being related to our experience of the world? Well, I think I'd first like to just qualify your summing up. Oh, would you? Please yes. do. I, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't you to appear to I, agree I with the, it if you don't. The way you, the way you summed it up, you, you made Locke seem a little bit inconsistent. Oh, did I? Uh, because, uh, as a matter of fact, it's true. It, uh, he's inclined to think that the world is composed of matter and minds. But he is consistent enough to say that since we don't know the nature of either, we can't even be sure of that. Ah, so he is a very, uh, very ready yes. to accept the possibility that materialism is true, that, that we thinking things are in fact uh, complex and subtle machines. How we work, we have no idea at all. But we, he's, he's ready to accept the, the, the possibility that uh, there is no... Cartesian soul, no um, immaterial, uh, naturally immortal soul. No. Actually, I'm glad you pulled me up on that, because he has an argument about that, which I think is marvellous, and which I still think carries its full clout today. Of us human beings, he says that one of two things must be true 
but both seem to us impossible to grasp. Either we must be material objects that think and have emotions, mm. or there must be something immaterial in us which thinks and has emotions, and is in that case mysteriously allied to a physical object, namely mm. our body. Now, Locke says, when we try to think our way through these two alternatives, we find that both of them are in a profound way unintelligible to us. Yes. And yet one of them must be true. Yes. Now, I, I, I still believe that. I think that's a good argument. Yes, the argument there is so strong that uh, one wonders why, uh, on other occasions, he says that dualism is probably true, but he never tells <laughs> us why. He says, yes. never justifies the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were right to bring that in. Yes. Now, let me try and move us on, as I did before, yes. to language. How does Locke's view of language uh, fit in to his view of our knowledge of the world? Well, uh, the book on language is really, I mean, a book on classification in all the various departments of, uh, uh, of knowledge, what makes for good classification. Um, the most interesting, I think, is, is the classification of the natural world. And uh, what he wants to do here is to reject the Aristotelian view that the world is composed of natural kinds and that science is a matter of identifying a natural kind and uh, examining the nature of each um, kind more or less separately. So um, you have to study the essence or nature of horses, cows, dogs, cats, and so forth. There just so are forth. these categories yes. in the world. Yes. yes. And um, he wants to reject that view, of course. Uh, but this has implications of classification. For well, the you, Aristotelian. Say, you say, of course, but somebody who hasn't thought about this before might not see the of course. I mean, uh, uh, I mean yes. aren't there, somebody might say, but there are dogs, or there are yes. cows, or there are horses. Well, well the of the course came from that? what went before. <laughs> the, the of course came from what went before, because... Yeah. Uh, um, given the view of the world as this great kind of mechanical object composed of lesser machines, then dogs and cats are little machines, and they function according to the basic laws of physics. Um, so there isn't a separate nature of dogs and a separate nature of cats. There's a different structure, but the uh, nature of the, uh, is in, I involved is really the same. I mean, the laws of nature involved are the same. Um, well, uh, given that view, I mean, his own view of the world as, as that sort of place, yeah. uh, then uh, there could, he, he concluded that there were no natural divisions into kinds, that there were resemblances at the level of observation, and these resemblances caused us, uh, quite reasonably, to slice the world up. But in the end, the slicing is done by us. It's not done by nature. I mean, for, Arist for the Aristotelian, uh, there are these natural divisions, natural species, and we simply identify them and name them. But for Locke, uh, we do the slicing up. And a consequence of this is that uh, the terms we use, like gold, water, uh, horse, dog, and so on, these are really arbitrarily, in the end, arbitrarily defined by us. A good they're, hu they're human categories. Yes. What would he have said about his own distinction between minds and material objects that we've talked about so much so far? I mean, isn't that a distinction of natural kinds? Isn't that found in reality and not just a distinction made by us in language? I, I think that would be, I mean, if, 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 I think he would agree that if that were... Um, if but dualism if that's the were way true, if that's the yes. way it is, then yes. that would be a distinction of kind. Yes. Uh, the, the kinds that he's attacking are the uh, Aristotelian kinds, which are all um, bodily. I mean, there isn't in the Aristotelian philosophy um, anything quite like the, um, the soul of Descartes, I mean, the, yes. that immaterial yes. Yes. object, substance. 